Hello everybody and welcome to Duchess Royale where I share my opinions and receipts on all things really interesting but with a focus on major talking points. Some housekeeping first though, make sure that you like this video, subscribe to the channel and also hit that notification bell so that you know when the next video is out. So let's just dive in. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today for the first roundup of the year covering January in order to say our goodbyes to our dearly not beloved monarchy of the UK. Sorry guys, it's not April Fools yet, but actually, even though the monarchy is not over yet, one of the things that kicked off this month of January was news that support for the continued existence of the monarchy has fallen to 48% of the British public. Now, even though the British tabloids, for obvious reasons, didn't spend much time on that because they're very much pro-royal, this is a really big thing because it's the first time that polling has dipped below 50% ever. And I'm pretty confident that behind closed doors, the royal family were shooketh. Honestly, January has really not been a good month for the welfare royals in other ways too, but particularly with that hanging over its head. Now, at the start of every January, you generally tend to hear people say phrases like, New Year, New Me, and by February, they're back to their pre-New Year ways. Now, I don't want to speak too soon, but reflecting on the month of January, Harry and Meghan supporters have been eaten. Dare I say this, but this could be the new era of them being outside side. And for the welfare royals, well, it looks like the reverse. So the theme for January in the Royal End seemed to be about being celebrated by Hollywood, being given awards. It was also about red carpet walks and big business deals being achieved. But that was just Harry and Meghan. On the flip side for the welfare royals, well, January has been about enlarged prostates, dodgy abdomens, suspicious hospital stays, and just really bad blowback from bad PR. <sighs> There's a lot to get through, so let's just jump right in. So, first up on the January Royal Roundup. It's another month, another royal biography. This one comes from Robert Hardman, who is a royal correspondent who also writes for the Daily Mail. That's right, the newspaper that Harry and Meghan are and have successfully sued. Now, even though this biography is about King Charles, the standout talking points taken from it were about, guess who? That's right, the Sussexes. This seems to be the desperate method royal reporters are using to try to skew the narrative against the Sussexes post Prince Harry's memoir Spare. So what they do is they write a sycophantic book about dull vanilla royals and then instead focus on the popular ones, that's the Sussexes, but just do it negatively. But the thing is that this talking point didn't even involve and had absolutely nothing to do with the royal that the book was actually about, King Charles. Instead, this particular talking point relates to a made-up story from palace sources that the Queen was unhappy with Harry and Meghan naming their daughter Princess Lilibet Diana, with Lilibet being the Queen's nickname. So here you can see the headline from the Daily Mail last month when they rushed to blast this on the front page. The big bombshell from the beginning of the week, we haven't had you on until today, was the apparent total anger and ire of her late majesty when she felt that childhood name Lilibet that she and her sister had shared because they couldn't say Elizabeth, very, very personal, had been hijacked by Harry and Meghan. But at the time, we had reports that completely contradicted this and indicated that the Queen was supportive of Lilibet being named after her. So we've got some of them on the screen now and specifically royal reporters in some of these articles stated that the name choice would not have taken the Queen by surprise and that she would have been asked and she would have been informed. This is alongside headlines reporting that the Queen was actually delighted with this. So of course this is to be expected of a grandmother who is being honoured. Also in addition to that 
Robert Hardman, at the time when the Queen was alive, had reinforced the likelihood of this when he spoke about the Queen's close relationship with Harry around the time of the Jubilee in summer 2022. Dare I ask, what have you learned about her relationship with Prince Harry and Meghan? Well, I think the relationship with Harry is still very strong. Um, it's, uh, you know, there is a real, uh, there's, there's a, a fondness, a bond there. He's devoted to her. Um, and, and she's very good at compartmentalising, talking to people who know her very well. You know, there's, there's, there's sort of family and there's business. So the whole issue of them leaving the royal family, um, their sussexroyal.com website, all that kind of thing, their, their patronages, that comes under, that's business. That gets dealt with separately. But in terms of grandmother, grandson relationship, it's still, it's still, it's still very strong. Fast forward to well over a year after the, her death, and he comes out with this story saying that actually the Queen was furious about Princess Lilibet being named in her honour. Now, I think that Hardman just felt that he could do this as part of the bandwagon energy that all the British media seemed to have to hit out at Harry and Meghan, who are thriving in another continent away from the royal fold. It was an easy hit because the Queen was loved by most and the thought of her being upset will reflect badly on the perpetrators and inspire bad will towards them. But really, this story is just pretty unbelievable, even for the people in the back. The Queen was a woman that Harry and Meghan had a special relationship with and became closer despite them moving away. I've spoken to more, more to my grandmother in the last year than I have done for many, many years. Do you hold Zoom calls? Uh, we did a couple of Zoom Sometimes. calls with Archie. Yeah, so I could see yeah. Archie. Interesting, my, my grandmother asked, asked us what Archie wanted for Christmas and Meg said a waffle maker. She sent us a waffle maker for Archie. No. So breakfast now, Meg makes up a beautiful like organic mix. Yeah. In the waffle maker. So, sir, sorry, you're glossing over the fact that I cannot for the life of me imagine the Queen ordering a waffle maker to be sent to Santa, but I can't get my head around I don't even know how to comment on that. Does the Queen Done. know how to use a Zoom? Uh, yes. Both my grandparents this do. This is crazy. We've Zoomed them a few times. They've seen Archie running around. But my, my grandfather, instead of like pressing leave meeting, yes. he just goes Doof. But I just picked up the phone and I, I called the Queen just to check in. You, you call. check in. You just check like, in. I, you know, I would. that's what we do. It's like being able to default to not having to every moment go, is that appropriate? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my grandmother and I have a, a really good relationship mm -hmm. and an understanding, and I have a deep respect for her. She's my colonel in chief. So they want us to believe that a queen who is supposed to be a leader, a symbol of strength and regal, was unable to let her grandson know that she did not give her blessing for the name. That there was no discussion about her reservations, and that instead she ran to her courtiers crying that the only thing I have left is my name, like this headline here. And they've taken that too. Come on, come on, get out of here. So they expect us to believe that the queen who went undercover, she went into stealth mode, hiding from her own courtiers the fact that she had arranged a secret meeting with Harry and Meghan way back in April 2022, just so that she can spend time with them on British soil, was actually confiding in her courtiers separately that actually I've met with them, but I don't want to give them the name. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> right, so this Lilibet story backfired for Hardman in a massive way, as it seemed that in his efforts to throw mud at the Sussexes through information from, as usual, a mysterious source, he overlooked how evil and spiteful the Queen would look if it was true. And even though the British media typically love anything to undermine the Sussexes, they ran with this and they platformed him on many shows where he gave interviews. So this version is probably version 1063 of the story of the Queen's reaction to the naming of Princess Lilibet Diana. And to be honest, the social media responses were all pretty similar to what Dr Proudman said here where she said, what kind of grandmother would be furious about her granddaughter being named after her? It shows Meghan and Harry's honour and respect for the late Queen, something insiders in the royal family seem to know little about. Shame on them for dragging a dead woman through the mud. 
Then users suggested that it was odd that of all the things the Queen could be angry about, let's not forget £12 million for Prince Andrew to a woman he claims he never met, but anyway, that she would be angry about her great-granddaughter being named after her. This one said, According to the media, she was not phased by Andrew's shenanigans. She paid off the woman he didn't know who accused him, but naming a baby after her was just a step too far. How to undo the Queen's reputation in one media headline. Genius. Then in answer to the palace source who claimed that the name was precious to the Queen only and it felt like the Sussexes stole it, well, knowledgeable social media highlighted this as stated in this post. The Queen's grandfather, King George IV, named one of his racehorses Lilibet after his granddaughter, Princess Elizabeth. So now we're expected to believe the Queen was upset her great-granddaughter was named after her. And they came with receipts, as you can see here. So Robert Hardman started to moonwalk like Michael when he realised that he had messed up royally. The story that he had intended was, I guess, for the purpose of damaging the Sussexes' reputation, ended up doing that for the Queen and instead tarnishing her legacy. So Robert then moved on to version 1064, where he softened the story a little bit for the Queen's image. This claim about Harry and Meghan calling the Queen mm. to ask if they can call their daughter mm. Lilibet. Now, a number of people would say, well, why did they need to even ask mm -hmm. her at all? The understanding was at the time that she gave her approval because they said we wouldn't have done it unless mm -hmm. she was supportive. Supportive, yeah. What is the truth? Well, was she supportive? Did she say, yes, it's OK? Was she honoured? Was she the, 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 the whole, the whole uh, the row about it, which I've alluded to in my book, wasn't to do with the actual naming of, of the child. You know, I mean, she, she adores Harry. She adored uh, uh, Lilibet. It was the way it was handled. It was the fact that she was presented as having given her blessing for something that had already been presented as a fait accompli. And the one thing you don't do with the Queen is put words in her mouth. She's always been extremely... Uh, she was always very clear about, you know, I did this, but I didn't do that. I mean, I always remember once she had been told that she'd been handed a speech and it began, I'm very glad to be back in Birmingham. And she crossed out the word very because she said, I'm glad to be back, but she thought it smacked of insincerity. You know, she absolutely... Her, her words were very, very careful. And so when... Uh, uh, Harry and Meghan's lawyers were effectively dragooning the palace into supporting their version of events. It was like, no. Yes. What you... That was the source of the anger. It was the handling of the naming, not the naming itself. If you so he wants us to believe that because the Sussexes paraphrased her words rather than said it verbatim, that is what made her angry. And as the paper said, the angriest she's ever been. <sighs> Honestly, the anti-Sussex royalist propagandists work harder so much harder than the devil. Anyway, after tarnishing the Queen's reputation and no doubt taking his 30 pieces of silver from the royal establishment, because by the way, it's understood that they gave approval for the book, it didn't even sell well. Only about 8,000 copies in the first week. So just before we entered the new year, the internet was set ablaze with a viral Clever Blends promotional video featuring none other than the Duchess of Sussex. Meghan Markle in a new ad for her favourite latte. Take a look closely. You can see Meghan appearing in this ad. Say Clever, an instant latte brand. So uh, do you see her yet? I don't see her yet. Oh, there she is. Right there in the background. That's right. You can see her uh, working away. That yeah. you've seen again. Uh, right over her shoulder there? Yeah. And at one point, uh, handing over a drink from a fridge, I think. Here it is uh, oh, right here there. as well. And yeah. if you're wondering how this all came about, apparently uh, Megan, a big lover of this uh, coffee brand that started as a uh, pop-up uh, coffee bar back in 2016. And uh, she is also one of the investors. Oh. Now she got those products in front of the right people like Oprah, who shared her love of the brand to her at the time, 19 million Instagram followers. And my new favorite golden super latte. And uh, it's called Clever. I think that's how you pronounce it. Clever. And in early January last month, a mere four years later, we learned that Clever Blends were now in the shops. 
and not just any shops, one of the biggest retailers in the United States of America, Target. That's 500 stores to be precise. Now the products are available on Amazon, so that's Amazon UK and Amazon US. And this is what has now become known as the Megan Effect. In and outside of the royal family, Megan's stamp of approval on products has had the ability to skyrocket businesses to the next level. The biggest breakthrough was in January when Meghan Markle wore Hyatt jeans on her first trip to Wales. Demand soared. Hyatt now has a three-month waiting list and it's about to move into bigger premises. And it doesn't stop there. She's been a blessing to many other businesses. And then two months after our launch, we got Meghan Markle to wear our pieces, which enabled us to grow the revenue significantly. And from there, we raised $1.2 million. So it's onwards and upwards. Now, the 10th of January marked the one year anniversary of Prince Harry's memoir, Spare. And that coincided with news that not only was that the best selling book of the year, as in the whole world, but his memoir is now the third best-selling memoir of all time based on turnover. And the fact that this is one of three memoirs that have crossed the 10 million mark. This article from Bookseller says that Prince Harry helped the book market hit an official value record high, though unit sales tumbled. So who would have thought that the book that they said no one would read would not only break records, but save the book industry for 2023. Now that's legendary. And while we're here, let's not forget about Megan because she also broke some records as well. Suits was recently announced just towards the end of January as the most streamed series of the year. So well done to both of them for breaking records. Early on in January, the British tabloids got really excited about Prince Harry not being included in a book which listed 200 alumni trainees of Sandhurst and Prince William wrote the foreword for this book. Now, it was proudly suggested that William may have even tried to ensure that Harry was not included in the book. Now, while I think that Harry was at home eating his food and not caring about this, the British tabloids definitely made a big deal as if it was the most humiliating thing for him to have been excluded. In a way, their reaction only suggested that deep down, they did really believe that he should have been included. Because otherwise, what's all the drama about? If he so obviously shouldn't have been included, why would you even start up a conversation about it? So, the shortlist was from 45,000 officers and there were other royals in there that didn't make the cut. So a Sandhurst spokesperson said, the book highlights the breadth of accomplishments and experience across Sandhurst graduates, rather than focusing on the most well-known. Big hitters like the wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill, astronaut Tim Peakes, rugby player Josh Lucy, and also James Blunt, seem pretty understandable as being in the book because they're not just alumni, but they also became big in another field. Now, you could say that Prince Harry was just another well-known attendee. But actually, I think that like those other names, he also has gone on to be quite big in another field. So he's a prince who has quite remarkably become an independent royal, not funded by the taxpayer. And he's now a philanthropist who has launched a massively successful Olympic Games for wounded veterans. So with the Invictus Games now being 10 years old, it also provides healing through physical support as well as through mental health provisions. So I actually do think that he should have got that credit and also that he probably did more than those other royals that didn't make the cut. So perhaps it was spite. But with the tabloids trying to make us think that this was some big humiliation for Harry, well, they were in for a rude awakening. On the 10th of January, yes, on that day, it was revealed that Prince Harry, along with three others, would be inducted into the Living Legends of Aviation Hall of Fame. Of course, this set off those pesky UK troglodytes to a curiously heightened state of unhingedness. It was unbelievable. And I think that the word legend is maybe the word that really triggered them especially since they've spent the last four years trying to sell the idea that Harry is far from a legend. 
So the narrative as to why the British establishment was so angry about Prince Harry receiving this award was that he apparently doesn't deserve it. So flying an Apache helicopter over many years in the army was minimised because of their childish upset with Harry. Now years ago, as you will see from the tabloid stories, including one from Rebecca English, who is now a Team William and Team Kate royal reporter, well back in 2011, she was singing Prince Harry's praises and calling him one of the best young pilots the country has ever seen and how he amazed American instructors with his flying skills. Prince Harry wowing a crowd while flying his Apache helicopter in an aerial display show this weekend. ABC's Lama Hassan has the story for us. Watch this jaw-dropping, death-defying stunt. Harry weaves in and out, flipping the chopper almost all the way on its back. So the turnaround and her backtracking on this is the fake news. Because after all, even the American platforms like ABC here in 2012 confirmed that Harry was named top of his class in his Apache helicopter training. Claiming that there are other people in the military who are more deserving is a really weak argument, especially when they don't burst a blood vessel over this guy, Prince Edward. He spent all of four months in the armed forces before quitting because he didn't like it. But yet he parades around in the medals that he was given by his mummy, looking like he was one of the most decorated war veterans ever. But anyway, back to the aviation wards. Other honorees include people like Tom Cruise, Harrison Ford, and the host himself, John Travolta. And so Prince Harry being another person who they chose is just as worthy in that lineup. But the British tabloids were whinging that there were other people that could have been honoured. But that argument just falls flat because Harry didn't take their spot. People are inducted on a yearly basis, so someone might be inducted in the future. And the response really just comes off as jealous, sour grapes. But since other countries are now actually becoming very much aware of the vendetta journalism in the UK against Prince Harry... Spokespeople on behalf of the award ceremony came out with statements like this on the screen, which says, Award insiders remain unfazed despite the criticisms, noting that the negativity will not get their attention. The organisers emphasise that inductees are nominated and selected by current living legends, who then are part of future selection processes. So that was basically their way of saying, Back up! Back up! The British media looked petty. In fact, they're now known for this. But American media were not having it. And they doubled down, explaining the process of how Harry was inducted and expressing with their full chest that the organisers thought that he was more than worthy. Committees make the final selection. So enough of these already appointed legends seem to agree Prince Harry is worthy of the title, Craig. What the tabloids didn't want to convey to the British public was that the recognition wasn't just about his 10 years as an aviator in the army, but also his follow-up work to support veterans through his Invictus Games and including mental health support with that as well. So it was like the Sandhurst book, but on a much grander scale. So Harry won, tabloid zero. Let's be real about this. A man living in the US being honoured by people in the US shouldn't have any bearing or effect on the people living in the UK. Except this award is confirmation that Harry is well respected in Hollywood, despite the British media spending so much time peddling the reverse. Tables at this event were reported to cost a minimum of $30,000 and they were all sold out on the first day of release with a waiting list for individual tickets. Now, I do want to say, putting aside the British tabloids, there were many people in the UK that were really happy for Prince Harry and felt that the award that he got, living legend of aviation, was very much well-deserved. So really, it was just the welfare royals, the British media, and the royalists with unwashed legs in the UK that were hating. Of course... As we know by now, this is deeply psychological. It's all because Prince Harry walked away from his seat at the royal family table and rejected the establishment. Fuck you all up the wrong one. Ta-ta. Bye-bye. 
And the royalists therefore want him to fail or to look like a failure. They want him to feel that he needs to and wants to come back to the welfare royal team. It's also because his and Meghan's failure outside of royalty will stroke their ego and push this idea that the royal establishment is magnificent and that you cannot do well outside of it if you're a royal. But instead, Prince Harry has gone forth and he has prospered. But whilst UK headlines and British TV presenters insulted the award show, claiming that it was low rent, that it was a cheap celebrity event, in that room that they were locked out of was power and influence. There was Jeff Bezos, Morgan Freeman, Kenny G, many others, and of course, John Travolta, the host himself. These were top billing people. And Prince Harry was the draw for the event. It was actually reported that they wanted to give Prince Harry his own ceremony. But Prince Harry, being the humble prince that he is, the people's prince, he chose to have it together with the other three legend inductees. Now, all of this is something that wouldn't and just doesn't happen for the welfare royals in the UK. And that is definitely where some of the anger comes from. Hollywood wouldn't off their own back have a gathering to honour and celebrate Prince William, even though he's heir to the throne. Apart from the fact that he hasn't done anything that could remotely put him in the field of legendary status, most people, or at least the average everyday American, doesn't really know him that well or any of his accomplishments, which are few and far between. So for this event, which went off without a hitch, the media did their best to sully the event in advance but also when reporting about it afterwards. One journalist claiming to have been in attendance used the opportunity to write a hit piece on a German prince that Prince Harry happened to take a selfie with. I mean, journalism in the UK would benefit from psychological tests being done on the journalists beforehand. They are the worst in the UK. In a strange turn of events, Three days before Prince Harry was set to receive his Living Legend Award, Kensington Palace sent out communications saying that Kate had undergone abdominal surgery. Just days after celebrating her 42nd birthday, Britain's Princess Kate is in the hospital where she's recovering from abdominal surgery. Now, the palace is being pretty tight-lipped about exactly what is going on, but the word is she'll be in the hospital for up to two weeks and out of the public eye until Easter. So there's concern. Now that's four months, practically a lifetime. And even for the average Joe with no medical knowledge, this really did seem like a tad excessive hospital stay and recovery time put together, unless it was something really, really serious. Now rarely does coverage of the welfare royal travel overseas, But on this occasion, a few outlets did a segment longer than a minute on them. Breaking news from the United Kingdom this morning. Some big news today involving the British royal family. And this situation and even the commentators seemed to struggle with understanding why and what procedure would have that kind of recovery time. Well, that is a long time. What kind of abdominal surgery? I mean, I had an emergency C-section and I was in the hospital for five days, not 10 to 14. Even qualified doctors brought onto shows to discuss this couldn't make sense of it. But even still, when there's, again, emergency surgery, sometimes open procedures, people don't stay for 10 to 14 days. Mm. You know, again, I'm wondering if there are other variables playing a role that we simply just don't know. What is even more suspect is that King Charles revealed on the very same day having routine surgery the following week. In the space of just 90 minutes yesterday, we learned first that Princess Catherine is recovering in hospital after undergoing abdominal surgery, and then that King Charles will be treated in a medical setting for an enlarged prostate next week. Now, of course, both health updates had the UK talking and the papers were on one, with headlines like, pray for them, and the nation is reeling. We do not care. Now, I don't tend to trust UK popularity polls because the comments on X and other social media platforms really kind of do show that the support for the monarchy really has fallen below 50%.
Where the monarchy may have thought that Kate would have a lot of goodwill from the public over her hospital stay and also her need for recovery time, much of the comments on social media were actually critical of the time that she was taken off work. And in the typical performative and disingenuous manner, within days, the monarchy reported or put out an announcement that all of a sudden they could look ahead and they could now tell us that Kate would be able to work from her bed. Girl, stop playing with us right now. I mean, do they honestly expect people to believe that and to think that other than turning up at events, cutting ribbons, reading speeches written for her, that she does any real work? This ex-user said... I follow lots of people on here and see a lot more talking about all sorts of things from Doctor Who to the latest Tory drama. The only people talking about Charles and Kate are those obsessed with them and those paid to do so. The country isn't reeling. The country isn't interested. Then there is this one that says, I've just managed to pick myself off the floor after reeling at the news of Charles and Kate's medical procedures. I think that might be a bit sarcastic, that one. And then there's also this one. Kate will work from bed. She's going to wave, smile and cut ribbons from bed. And then several laughing emojis. And then there's another one here. Kate doesn't work when she's healthy, but suddenly when she's in bed recovering from surgery, she wants to work. The PR is all over the place. And there was a lot more like that in similar vein. I think a lot of people don't really think that Kate works. That's the bottom line. The other thing is that it was announced that Prince William would also be taking time off in order to care for the children and to support Kate. So he was really given this image as wonderful husband and amazing father. But the thing is that this whole hospital stuff has been really interesting And the PR has been terrible. And what it seems to have done is expose that basically what Prince Harry has indicated, that this is a family that do not operate like a real family. Indeed, it looks a little bit dysfunctional and out of touch. Despite one, what looks like a stage photo of William specifically driving himself past the hospital and past the camera crew, It doesn't appear that Prince William actually visited his beloved wife many times at all. Seeing the discourse about this on X, the cheerleader, mouthpiece, and their favourite reporter, Rebecca English, then wrote this in their defence. Royals don't tend to visit each other in hospital, so there can be no stronger signal of Charles and Kate's bond than his trip to her bedside before his prostate operation. The family are more united than ever. Now, all this tells me is that Prince William was not visiting Kate regularly. And King Charles, apparently stopping by to see Kate on his way to his own medical appointment, was him being praised for doing the bare minimum, yet it was seen as quite extraordinary. But guess what? That's what a normal family does. Also... Camilla's movement, now they were interesting because they kind of disproved this headline as she was papped daily going in and out of the hospital to visit Charles. So what was going on with Prince William then? So Prince William, where you at? When it comes to news released deliberately by the welfare royals, there is always some suspicion, some motive in my eyes about the timing. And to be honest... This being released three days before Harry was to receive his Living Legend Awards. To me, well, it just doesn't seem like a coincidence. It's odd that instead of waiting for Kate to return home, they announced this news while she was still in the hospital. And also, she'd already been operated. And it was just before discharge. And then they also announced Charles's stuff a good week before he was due to go in for his operation. So I personally think that this was done for a number of reasons, but I think one was also to overshadow and put a narrative over Harry's Living Legend Award, which they were heavily triggered by, as we know. So all the headlines about this in the run up, but mainly in the UK about the event itself, attempted to slot Kate and King Charles' names into the mix. So from that, they could get clout of his publicity, knowing that Prince Harry and Meghan tend to have a much further global reach in the UK and overseas. 
and also much more online engagement than the welfare royals. So by slotting their names in, they would also get news about the hospitalisation out there as well. But it would also be an attempt to shift the focus of Harry getting honoured and instead centre it around how Harry should talk about them, reach out to them and just sort of give some sort of statement. But anyway, he made a four minute speech. Yeah. Uh, and didn't mention the king or king. Oh, Bitch, please. Of course, this is the height of hypocrisy, as the media have spent years suggesting that it's Prince Harry that is the problem, that is the traitor, and that is untrustworthy. When obviously we know that's not true, and it's the other way round. It's just that Harry did not protect the royal family from exposure of the ill treatment of him and Meghan with silence. And that was only because they had continued to attack him and his wife through royal reporters for a year and onwards after he had left. Anyway, royal reporters have put out on behalf of the palace stories saying that Kate and William wanted nothing to do with him. This royal reporter came out to say that the way that Kate and William felt about Harry and Meghan, they would probably prefer to have Prince Andrew as their neighbour. Let's also not forget this headline about it being the hardest thing that Kate ever had to do in her life, doing a crowd walkabout with Harry and Meghan when the Queen died. So, based on that, why should Harry, who was so unwanted by the welfare royals, take a 14-hour flight and fly over when it's implied that the very sight of him would give them a heart attack or cause them distress? Also, both Charles and Kate were reportedly doing well, so what exactly was it expected that Harry, who has to apparently give 28 days notice to come into the country. What was it expected that he would do when he got here? Hold Kate's hand, give her bed baths? Of course, the truth is that they just wanted to use Prince Harry for their own rehabilitation, especially following the disclosure of who the royal racists were who were concerned about Prince Archie's likely skin tone. The royals who are named are King Charles and Catherine, Princess of Wales. So if he came over, it would look like all those past grievances were nothing and that they were just trivial. But also, I think the main thing about this whole royal PR around this time was really just to disrupt Harry's plans and basically him being honoured. They wanted him not to go to the award show. Some reporters were saying that he should decline the award and some were just saying that he needed to tone it down. You might be offered an award. You might be told we would like to bestow upon you the great honour of whatever this award is. But it is within your gift to say, well, thank you very much. I don't think I deserve it. So it would have been possible for Harry to say, thank you very much, very delighted, very kind of you. But I don't really think I am an aviation legend and I don't feel right about accepting it. So no, thank you. He could have done that. In terms of the welfare royal's health and the PR handling of this, this saga continues and I suspect that the mystery around Kate's health will keep her in the papers while she's out of the public eye and also that it will continue to be used as a stick to beat Prince Harry and Meghan throughout the months. Now I have no idea what the royal plan is with Kensington Palace but I don't think it's a good one. Certainly Kate Middleton has never been talked about this much before, it's very unusual. Already there's been major speculation over Kate's surgery is it an eating disorder? Is it problems with alcoholism? Is it mental health issues, domestic violence, all of the above? One thing is for sure, no one really believes it was a simple abdominal surgery. The papers in the UK have kindly given them some privacy, which is something that they would never have done for Prince Harry and Meghan. The media have agreed not to have photographers down, they're not to have camera crews, not to have journalists, to allow her to recuperate from her operation in privacy and also you know, respect the privacy of the other patients at the hospital. Invisible contract, right? So the saga continues, but if the PR was to arouse goodwill and public support, I think the palace got it wrong. Now, if there was one thing that I didn't see on my bingo card, it was Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, and Prince Harry being in Jamaica this January. Yep. Pictures of Harry and Meghan at the One Love movie premiere, a biopic on the life of legendary Bob Marley, 
dropped on X in the early hours of Wednesday the 24th of January. From the sun-kissed glow and the happiness radiating from that power couple, it was inevitable that Struggle Island, that is the UK, was going to wake up and become apoplectic. True to form, the tabloids and the great unwashed started their tantrums. <laughs> Meghan and Harry were pictured with the CEO of Paramount Studios and his wife, Tracy James, who we understand they are friends with and also live in Montecito too. They later met and they snapped pictures with members of the Marley family, as well as the Jamaican Prime Minister, Andrew Holness and his wife. Now, if we cast ourselves back to March 2022, then we have a tale of two royal couples and William and Kate's disastrous tour of the Caribbean, where they were essentially fired by Andrew Holness live on TV. Remember this? But Jamaica is, as you would see, uh, a country that is very proud of our history, very proud of what we have achieved. And uh, we are moving on. And we intend to attain in short order our development goals uh, and fulfill our true ambitions and destiny as an independent, uh, developed, prosperous country. Well, this Jamaica trip for the Sussexes seemed much more successful than that. Meghan looked beautiful and she was floating around like the princess that she is. There was clearly a buzz in the air. Brian Robbins knew what he was doing by inviting Meghan and Harry who have been to Jamaica several times. News platforms all around the world reported on this, giving the movie much promo that it wouldn't have got without their presence. Prince Harry and Meghan have made a surprise trip to Jamaica. No one had expected them, but very quickly, the Jamaican capital knew Harry and Meghan were in town. A surprise appearance as Jamaica gathered to celebrate the movie about this country's most famous son. These songs of freedom. Filmed in and around Trenchtown in Kingston, where Bob Marley grew up, this premiere was a big enough draw for the Sussexes to leave California for the Caribbean. In fact, it was reminiscent of how, before they stepped back as working royals, Prince Harry and Meghan were charming the socks off the Commonwealth. I am here with you as a mother, as a wife, as a woman, as a woman of color, and as your sister. There's like a rock star vibe. People screamed when she came out of the car. It's just, yeah, I just, you just don't see this with the royal family. And how they would have helped stem the flow of countries wanting to leave since then. So more British tabloid writers, such as these two from the Daily Mail, were letting off steam. But there they are in Jamaica, which is a country that is bordering on republicanism. The Prime Minister of Jamaica has made it absolutely clear he wants nothing more to do with monarchy. He thinks it's past its self date. So in the very week the King is going into hospital, his own son, who hasn't found time yet, sir, to say, sorry that dad's not feeling so good and sending my best wishes and we don't think that's happened privately. He's there consulting and hobnobbing with one of the most overtly Republican mm. Prime Ministers in the Caribbean. I can't believe it. Yeah, it seems that the Brexit loving lot who wanted to break away from Europe so that they can govern themselves cannot compute why Jamaica would want to do the very same thing and have a democratically elected Jamaican head of state rather than a old dusty monarch from over across the seas. Instead, they see this vision as an attack against the monarchy and that this prime minister represents an anti-monarch figure, which is automatically an evil one. The British media really showed their asses, but at this point, it was becoming laughable. Now, what the media are really mad about is that Prince Harry and Meghan are invited to places where there are high profile people. And that rather than having to invite themselves like the welfare royals did for the tour of the Caribbean, Harry and Meghan get invited. Mr. William, I see you love to dance with the black people and you love to frolic, but speak some truth on this trip. Speak truth for what it's worth. Kate and the Duke and Duchess William, they haven't done anything to us, but they represent, they represent a certain kind of history that is unpleasant for our people. This visit, how much is the Queen paying for it? Isn't Jamaicans the one that are paying for it? 
As you can see here, the reservations of Jamaicans with Kate and William's visit was in stark contrast to that of Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan, which was met with so much joy and excitement. This is why the press and the royals are big mad. Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan are seen as royal rock stars globally, and this is how they wish that Kate and William were perceived abroad. Now, to add to this, they are super mad because they spent the majority of the 18 months while Duchess Meghan was a working royal writing hit pieces against her to try and convince the public that she was unroyal, that she wasn't up to standard and that she was beneath basic Kate. They tried to make it seem like she couldn't get anything right and that she was unroyal because she crossed her legs differently from Kate, for example. Or how she was always breaking protocol, how she wore the wrong colour nail varnish, how she shut her own door, all those kind of silly, silly things. But in reality, that was always just projection and just the opportunity to dull back on her brilliance. <laughs> You're such an inspiration to me. I'm like, you're just you know, this biracial actress, feminist, and that's everything that I am, everything that I want. And after she left, that's when I broke down because it was just meeting, you know, your hero, and that's wild. So she is your hero? She's my hero, 1,000%. They're just extra mad now that they have no control over Harry and Meghan, where they go, and how they shine when they go where they go. And the fact that... When they do these things, they just expose that they do the job better than William and Kate. The British media discourse around Meghan and Harry walking the red carpet at this Jamaican premiere of the One Love movie typically was unhinged. They, of course, tied in the fact that Prince Harry and Meghan were enjoying themselves while Kate and Charles were having or going to have operations. But from the other side of the mouth, they were also saying that Charles and Kate were doing well. Anyway, as I said before, this will be the new line from them from now on. They're always going to stay negative on Meghan and Harry. And I really do believe that Meghan and Harry have got the British media in a chokehold and a catch-22. You see, the British media need to present Harry and Meghan as the wrong -ins. They need to dull their shine to avoid the risk of a repeat of scenes like this should they come back to the UK. We've not we want to see Meghan, demanded the crowds in South London. Expect to hear a lot of that between now and the wedding in May and beyond. They're the ones that we love the most, or yeah. I love the most yeah, anyway, because yeah, yeah. I think they're just so, like, normal. So the media, in a sense, are locked into being negative about them. You're a talent and PR man, so you'll be used to uh, some of your clients perhaps making uh, silly decisions. Is this one in your view when it comes to Meghan and Harry? I like the way you set up the question by saying silly decision, which is kind of indicating your viewpoint already. I'm not sure it's a silly decision. So she's been invited to the premiere and gone. Is, is there nothing there that you think might be problematic? However, the British press can't escape from the fact that the world, especially those in the Commonwealth, are watching and they're seeing the vile, mean-spirited vendetta articles that are constantly pumped out about Meghan and Harry. This only goes to show people in these countries how abusive the media and the royal family is. And it just validates Meghan and Harry's claims made in the Oprah interview, the Netflix documentary and also Harry's memoir, Spare. It just doesn't go unnoticed how unhinged the British press is. And the American press, but the British press is, is, is almost odd to me. It's sort of bizarre how vicious they can be. Jamaicans got to see firsthand what Meghan and Harry have been dealing with for years with the British press, simply because they had the audacity to walk the red carpet and shake hands with the Jamaican Prime Minister. A popular morning show host discussed some of the headlines coming out of the UK and summed up the British media perfectly. Bitter. And, you know, somebody needs to say it. People just like Harry and Meghan more. There's also that. You know, let's just be honest. Well, the YouTubers have said it. Yeah, that, <laughs> let's just be honest. There's also that. Yeah? Yeah. One but, said, sounds like they're jealous of um, the reception that Harry and Meghan was given by Jamaicans. Bitter. <laughs> bitter, bitter, bitter. 
The British media even took shots at the Jamaican Prime Minister, showing him their juvenility and highlighting their stupidity. But all in all, he dismissed the drama that the press tried to create. When I was asked to participate in the uh, premiere, the uh, premiere, the local premiere of the Bob Marley biopic, One Love, I was pleased. Uh, and I was also very happy to see royals coming to participate in this major event. Uh, unsuspecting. <laughs> Little did I know that uh, uh, I would be drawn into some internal issues <laughs> in the United Kingdom. But so it is. Uh, more publicity for Jamaica. <laughs> He's right. All the press achieved with the Karenin was more publicity for the movie and for Jamaica. At this point, I want to share a quote from an article written for The Guardian about this trip of Meghan and Harry to the Jamaican premiere. Nell said, the UK headlines and sour grapes tell you one thing. We messed up and we know it. Meghan was and remains soft power dynamite. And all we have now is the soft power kryptonite of William and Kate and the Windsor firm that spurned her. Other than Kate and Will, Prince Edward or, or whatever his name is, was in South Africa on a tour. And the most interesting thing from that was that he talked to a large turtle. Very little coverage of this. Sophie was dancing with some people on an engagement while Kate lay sick and King Charles was preparing for surgery. The headlines didn't care about that. But if January is anything to go by, the Sussexes will be the cause of an epidemic of hypertension in the UK and more unroyal family hospitalizations, probably. It's going to be an interesting year. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, leave a comment, let me know your thoughts on this. If you want to drop a super chat, do that. I'm not stopping you, but I hope to see you on the next video. So peace and I'm out.